The purpose of this video is to introduce resiliency strategies for students making the transition from tribal colleges into four-year mainstream institutions. Another facet of this video is encouraging the use of tribal or family practices and cultural foundations as resiliency practices while attending a four-year institution. Finally, considerations will be presented for educators, professionals, and others returning to the reservation after working in the mainstream, in military service, or attending college elsewhere. Many students, particularly those raised in reservation communities, have seldom had the opportunity to spend an extended amount of time in mainstream communities or off the reservation. Most of the time, their view of the outside world or life off the reservation is a trip to Billings, Sheridan, or Hardin. There are occasional visits to other cities during maybe basketball tournaments or school-related activities. They also have a cosmetic or maybe a Hollywood-style view of life off the reservation through the television, Bellings Gazette, and through movies. When a student from the reservation leaves to attend mainstream colleges or universities, they experience culture shock. They are unaccustomed to the crowds and lack information or experience in dealing with their new surroundings. Basically, they do not know how to immediately deal with these situations. Eventually, some survive, some flourish, while others may drop out and return to the reservation having a bad taste in their mouth because of perceived ignorance, biasness, misunderstanding, bad choices due to the lack of preparation and planning. The efforts of this educational video are to provide an orientation and assist transferring students in preparing for a transition into mainstream environments like higher education or employment off reservation. In getting to the point, educators developed in this presentation will focus on planning and preparation. Then they will be encouraged to tie in these concepts with comparisons in the Crow or Native culture as an active process in their learning. Crow students will be reminded or introduced to educational or cultural practices within their families, clans, and tribes as foundations for making decisions, taking action, and surviving in their experience in the mainstream. Further efforts are to encourage Native students to examine foundations within their culture so they can interpret and understand the abstracts of mainstream information presented in their coursework. Recommendations and lists will be developed as a recipe or process to follow for applying Crow cultural practices to the higher education experience. Later, this presentation will discuss strategies and recommendations for graduates returning to the reservation. The purpose being is that they also need reorientation into their community. Unlike their educational experience, little may have changed there. They might assume that their community changed or there is some great need for change. Sometimes this is not the case. Some could care less. Most people in the world know how difficult change can be. For others, they enjoy and strive for change. Crow educators are most familiar with this. A reason may be asked, why focus on the subject? Well, there are many reasons. Even though elders or respected adults may promote education, it does not mean they wish to implement it. It is hard for them to change a way of life that they're not familiar with, especially if they cherish the one that they live. Furthermore, if it was brought by the white man, they feel they might not have any ownership in this change. Another reason for this discussion relating to change is that sometimes community professionals, particularly in government agencies, see newly educated graduates as a threat. They resist change and new ideas from sources such as these Crow graduates. They are stuck in some status quo of their job position and authority. Sometimes their reaction to the new employees and recent graduates is harsh, intimidating, and emotional. Some of these professionals cherish their authority and control so much that any perceived threat to their gravy train is a personal threat. So they attack and treat educated Crow members differently, sometimes harshly and critically. 
As a Crow educator, I've personally discussed this problem with recent graduates and those returning to the reservation about being away for an extended amount of time. It is hard to imagine the intensity and the resentment that they feel. Just because their efforts are to improve their quality of life, they have to suffer this resentment, this misunderstanding, and mistrust. I have visited with tribal members in tears and frustrated by the treatment of the old guard who seem threatened by their education and new ideas for change. Even if this change is for the good, they are so defensive that they will not recognize the constructive efforts for community building and only acknowledge despite and jealousy. All criticism is not with the old politicians and those who do not like change. Sometimes it is the responsibility of the recent graduates to have the ability to communicate well with those not familiar with their ideas, plans, and intentions. Occasionally, a well-intended graduate might assume that their perception of success, education, and community development is shared by everyone. It might be far from that. Sometimes in their glory, graduates assume that those in a community follow what they're saying just because they have a degree or that they're very passionate about something. What that graduate overlooks in doing this is that they fail to completely inform those willing to listen the thorough points of their ideas such as details, direction, history, and other information to back up their intentions. Basically, they leave them hanging in a way. They also failed to build a bridge so that they could create understanding. In the extreme, some educators blame community ignorance when that is far from the truth. It is about taking responsibility and being thorough, especially in communication. Sometimes, in an emotional state, individuals react and direct negative comments or accusations to those who were originally willing to build relationships. Then these individuals become upset, react, then conflict arises. One repercussion is that recent graduates are then shunned, considered troublemakers, and acting too good, when in reality it's just a matter of effective communication. Some educators with all good intentions to help their people end up working elsewhere, maybe off the reservation or totally away from their roots. In presenting this discussion, a list of tactful recommendations and strategies will be presented for learners to consider and apply in their educational and professional experience. The strategies recommended encompass practices in community building, leadership, respect, compromise, and making consolations for reinforcing empowerment. In our next presentation, we will introduce two internationally known Apsalogan educators, both professionals, educators, nativists, doctors, and humanitarians. They will share their experience and facilitate suggestions relating to resiliency. Both have unique personal foundations within our culture and are great leaders. As a transfer student, you're stepping into a whole new environment and you're going someplace that very few people have gone. And I know that uh, when you think back about this, you know there are people in your family who have encouraged you. Among the students that I have met who have successfully transferred, every one of them have someone, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a friend, from their hometown who has said, you have it, you have the talent to do this. You can have that degree, I see that in you. So at this moment in transferring, it's real important to think about who that person is. Visit that person, reflect on the words they said to you, know that you are, you know, you're worthy of this big step. Uh, and encourage those people, whoever it is, I know in my case there's an uncle, he would always say, you can do it, you're a smart person, you know, you need to go and get that education. And every time I went home, I'd go visit him, because he would say that again and again to me, and I needed that, I needed that encouragement. So when you think about what got you here, you know that there's family members who are very, very trusting in your talent and your ability, and will encourage you every chance they get. 
But there's another side to this, and that is there are people who will say things that will probably discourage you. They'll say things, oh, I knew you when you were in elementary school, and you, you didn't have any of this potential. What do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? It's time for you to realize you should stay away from those people. Um, those aren't the kind that are going to encourage you. And there are plenty of people out there who could give you a discouraging word. But now that you're on this transfer path, you want to remember that there are people who believe in you, who see that potential in you, and know that you can do this. So those are the sorts of people that you want to be around. Yes, and there obviously are. You have taken that encouragement. You've taken this step. You're on this path. And so while there will be moments when you have second thoughts, you can go to those people and get that encouragement. Take, you know, take that to heart. Think about that. Yeah, people believe in me. I can do this. I can be a transfer student and I can successfully um, step into these classes. I can go to Billings. I can go to this transfer institution and make uh, all the pro progress I need to. You as a Crow Indian person are going to carry out your life just the way you always have. Your culture will come with you wherever you go. And this is, in this educational experience, it's of utmost importance for you to carry out the responsibilities you have in your culture, to participate in events. For example, when a test is coming up, or a major moment in your education, that's time for a clan feast. That's time for prayers. If there are people in your family who you rely on to help you with this, that's time when you should do that. Uh, if you are having us an assignment for a paper, go study our clan ways. Go study our language. Study the history of our Crow people. Utilize that opportunity to expand your knowledge of your Crow culture. Take every opportunity to bring that up in conversation because the way in which you learn in your discipline will be a whole lot richer. It'll apply so much better to what you, what you will do in your career if you can study within the context of the knowledge of our Crow people. So when you have an assignment, when you have the opportunity to go into and expand on uh, your research, take that opportunity to know a whole lot more. Every time on your campus there's a gathering of Indian people, especially here at Billings, at MSU Billings or here at Rocky, the majority of the students are Crow Indian. Take the time to be with Indian people. It, it really makes your heart stronger. We can know that participating in an Indian club, for example, the Indian club at MSUB or American Indian Cultural Association here at Rocky, the students who participate in club activities, they're side by side working together with other Crow people, they are stronger students. They can talk about things. And also there are prayer ceremonies, there are cultural events on campus. And Everyone brings their culture. American Indian people bring their culture with them. They don't leave it at home. They don't leave it and act like they're little brown white people when they come onto a college campus. They need to be, you need to be able to express yourself fully as a Crow person. And the better you are at doing that, the stronger student you're going to be, the closer you'll be to achieving that goal of a degree. Sure. In a college setting, on a daily basis, you rub elbows with your fellow students and with faculty members who have very little knowledge of American Indians. For the most part, they never did go to an Indian reservation. They never did in, know an Indian person. So what they know, you could probably put uh, in a thimble, you might say. Uh, you know, it comes down to what might be a three or four paragraphs in a history book, uh, some movie that they saw about Indians some time ago, like maybe they saw Billy Jack or they saw, um, you know, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of really funny Indian movies too that uh, something about a medicine man or, you know, there's stereotypic ideas and images about Indians. 
and there's it comes down to misinformation it really does um, so here you are you're in a college classroom and you think these people uh, should know about uh, how we live today in modern uh, Montana in this region but for the most part they don't so you get into these conversations where you know people say things like is it really true that you get a payment every month from the government you know there's actually a hundred of the dumbest questions that Indians get asked you will get asked those questions do you get payments um, uh, you're rich because of casinos or um, you're all dumb or you're all on welfare uh, there's all kinds of uh, there's that dumb list of that list of dumb questions and you'll get them in the college classroom because our students our fellow students and our faculty haven't the advantage of ever studying about Native Americans so the, the thing that you have to keep in mind here is that it'll happen to you it'll happen to you and you're gonna need to be ready to say uh, you know I just not I, I don't have time to talk about that today or maybe you want to keep in your hip pocket answers to the 100 most common questions that are asked of Indian people and that's actually on the internet why not keep 150 copies in your briefcase and just hand them out every time one of those questions come up but it's hard to be humorous about this especially after it happens 20 30 times in the course of your first semester and I know that uh, there's faculty members who make really offhand remarks years ago I know that there was a professor at a leading university who said something like this all Indians are best friends with old Jim Beam well that sounds real funny doesn't it but it implies that all Indians are alcoholics and it it, it really uh, set back the Indian students in this college classroom and some of them left and never returned they got their anger going you know they they got paralyzed by it they said well you know I'm just gonna walk out of this classroom and I I don't like this faculty member he disrespects me so you see sometimes this idea of people being ignorant acting out of stereotypes you know saying things off the wall that they think are really funny and humor can be based in bias and racism there you are you're by yourself you're thinking of that it's out there and you're wondering what in the world am I gonna do on a daily basis you've got to expect it Montana hasn't changed a lot what we learn in our schools what we talk about in our homes and communities what we see in the paper and what we see in movies there's a lot of misinformation and stereotypic kinds of, of uh, indicators there and it affects us so here again it's a matter of being prepared what are you gonna say you can't let this stuff set you back you've got a job to do you're a full-time student you've got assignments to do and if you sit two or three evenings and you're mad about something somebody said in a class because they're misinformed because they believe stereotypes you're wasting your time it's no skin off anybody's nose <clears throat> but you're wasting your time in a college classroom yeah you can you can uh, bring up information that will answer those questions and maybe that's your way of handling it or you could say excuse me I'd rather not deal with that right now or maybe you want to have answers to the 100 most commonly asked questions and you know they're stupid you know you don't want to waste time but you need to deal with it so those are the those are the things that every single transfer student deals with and you've got to be flexible you've got to be realize it's going to happen you need to fix you know and you need to have a way of fixing that situation in your own mind that lets you continue to follow that path yeah the next day you can walk into that classroom with that same egghead who comes up with the question about casinos or comes up with the questions about alcoholics um, you still got to go back to that class and continue on When we talk about being a member of the Crow tribe, you have belonged to a very simple tribal relationship, which is complex in the eyes of other people. But to those who live this life called the Crow way of life, it's not complex at all. 
uh, they say you have to learn to use it. You learn to use it by living it. Uh, sometimes some of it can be taught because the teaching process varies from one person to another. Uh, let me uh, touch upon that in terms of today's youth, today's situation. Let's take a graduate of Little Bighorn College. He's here with members of the tribe, studies tribal issues, looks at tribal, tribal history, tribal principles, and there's some familiarity because of his upbringing among the Sadoge people, even the language, and may even talk, talk Crow language. During that process, he finds that the principal elements of the Crow have to deal with a great deal of spirituality. And that spirituality is to be found in just about every reference that you can make. They tell us that you don't do anything without some backup. By that backup they mean that you should be prepared for what it is that you're doing. So if you go into education, you should be prepared with all the preparation that you need to go to that school with, uh, whether it's language, culture, experience, exposure, understanding, whatever it is. But let's narrow it down to this Crow student who comes out of Lickborn, Little Bighorn College and goes to a four-year institution. He leaves Little Bighorn College and all of a sudden that familiarity is gone. He leaves Little Bighorn College and all of a sudden the discipline is there. In here at Little Bighorn College he has a personal relationship with the staff and the faculty and the other students so that sometimes he doesn't have to be right there 100% of the time. Sometimes he doesn't have to attend classes 100% of the time. Even though he is judged on how good a student he is by his attendance, attendance and punctuality are somewhat abused now and then simply because of the familiarity. Now let's switch gears and go to a four-year institution. There it's very precise. It's very definite. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It has to be on time. You have to be there. You have to meet the assignments. Your attendance has to be there. And you have to meet every assignment. There's no putting it off. And when it comes time to grade you, they don't look at you and say, uh, he might do better. They say, he did this. There's no future in grading. It's all past performance. Having said that, that means that they have to be more adjusted to the demands of the time. It's a challenge to be there on time, to be there all the time, and to make a complete report on what it is that you have to do. We're not used to those kind of things. Because here we say, uh, tell them I'll be in a little bit late. I have to leave early. I have to tend to some other business. Uh, and the people are very understanding. Why? Because Little Bighorn College is more of an orientation to a broader world out there, but it's still not that great big world. Because we're still talking crow. We're still doing the crow things. We understand when we have to go to a crow celebration we have to go to a crow funeral. We know all those things. So we're, we're understanding people. Outside of the crow tribe, that understanding is not there. They're, they're very precise. So how do we prepare for it? Being a member of the crow tribe, you can do it so many different ways. Because today, we are graduating students out of Little Bighorn College. And they come from clans. And they come from many different backgrounds, but there's always that spirituality. And remember this, no matter who you are, if you belong to the Crow tribe and you have been given an Indian name, just remember that name sometimes was designed for you, was intended for you, even before you were born. And when that name was given, 
It was not it was not meant to sound pretty, but it was to reflect the truth. They say a, a true name is a good name. A true name will bring good good graces, good fortune. So you were given a name, and when you have that name, those wishes that made for you is like a goal in life. They say your life is going to be this way. Your life is going to be full of these good things. Forget about the bad things. Look at the good things. Be positive. Have a positive outlook on life. Given that, I'd like to use Dr. Lenny Realver as an example. When he was a little guy, his late father, Edison Realver, came to me and he said, Big Brother, I have a son. I want you to give him his name. He said, uh, the crow way is to try to find someone who will give a name that will be the truth and have good wishes with it. I want you to do that for me. And so it was that I went with Lanny's father to their grand, to Lanny's grandmother's place where they killed a beef. We had a good feed. We had a good picnic. The time came to name Lanny to give him a crow name. And among the things that I offered was this idea. I was fortunate as a young man to be selected for a job that was known all over the country. It was announced that I had this job at the top level of government and that uh, everybody should know about it. So I called Lanny by that name. His job is well known. His job is distinguished. With the wish that because this was true, that I wish that this young man would have good fortune to have a good education, to have a good job, and wherever he went, to have people respect him for the kind of good job that he would do. Today I see Dr. Lenny Realberg heading up projects, doing this kind of project, uh, leading people, bringing people together, bringing several tribes together, and make them follow in the direction of where he believes Indians should be for their own betterment. When that happens, then I look back and say, hey, the clan system is working. Hey, the spirituality is working. Not only that, but the name, the name-giving wish is working. Not only that, but the clan brotherhood, the clan children system, where the clan elders look out for the, for the children of that clan, that's working. So you begin to have this network. You not only have clan, not only have tribe, but you have names. Now that having said that, then we go into the other kind, parts of the life that we have and how we might harness these things. Now, Lanny Realberg has a doctor's degree. He goes into the world. Now he's going to do something that has never been done before. Does Lanny Realberg say, look, I got a doctor's degree. I'm going to do it this way. It's going to be right. Uh-uh. He has good advice. He says, I'm going to take my elders. I'm going to consult with them. I'm going to get their advice. And once they give me their advice, then I'll choose what I'm going to do. This way I maintain my options. I'm not locked into just one thing. Because Dr. Realberg then says, come here, clan elder. Maybe one of us, maybe two of us, maybe several of us, maybe a group of us. Then he'll tell us, my clan elders, I want to do this thing. And I just want your input. I want your advice. I want your blessing. I want your wishes to help me do what I'm going to do. Here's what I want to do. He'll say it. And others will never have been there. But they'll say, well, I think you should do this. I think you should do that. So now, Lanny Realberg not, does not have just his own thinking, but a whole array of options to consider. When he picks that, his chances of success are increased many times over. So now you not only have your clan system, but a way to use it. 
But then other times, Lanny Reelberg will say, uh, Clan Elder, uh, I've got a little extra money here. I want you to have a good meal. Enjoy a good meal. Go ahead. And the, the person will turn around and say, they tell us that you always have, have something in return. Because you gave me a treat, I'm going to make a wish for you. Whatever it is you're going after, I was always fortunate in meeting any challenge and succeeding. I wish that for you. Laddie Reelbert goes, goes, goes from there and meets his own challenge. I use that as an example. I apologize for using Dr. Reelbert as, as an example, but I have personal knowledge about him. I have personal knowledge about his relationship. I have personal knowledge about his conduct. I have personal knowledge about his success, and I can use that as an example. Why is he this way? It's because he is resilient. He has all kinds of objects in ahead of him. He has all kinds of setbacks facing him. He has all kinds of difficult things to contend with, but he draws from his tribal background, his cultural background, his spiritual background, and he goes forward and says, I'm going to succeed and I'll use my tribal background. I'll not only put my non-Indian non education to work, but I'll put my Indian education, I'll put them together and make it work. And it's succeeded for him. And that's what I'm suggesting. You leave Little Bighorn College. You have a certificate from there. Now you're going to a four-year institution. It's different. But draw from your tribal background. Draw from your the stories that you've heard that the Crows never gave up. They were outnumbered, something like 30 to four, 40 to 1. And people were trying to push them from their land. They stood their ground. Why did they stand their ground? Because they had individuals who suffered defeat now and then, but they were resilient enough to come right back and stand their ground when it counted. You talk about the, the fight, the battle on Prior Creek, when the Sioux, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho got together and were going to wipe out the Crow. They were outnumbered at least 10 to 1 with rifles, and maybe 30 to 1, 40 to 1 otherwise. They stood their ground. Why? Because they said this, we Crows may be outnumbered, but we're resilient enough that we can push back anybody and hold this country for our dear ones, our women and children, and our succeeding generations. You can go to a clan elder and say, I'm going to go off to school, which suggests make a wish for me. Or you might even say, I'm going to go off to school, uh, wish me well. I'm going to go off to school, say a prayer for me. Uh, I'm going to go off to school, remember me. Once you've done that, you're building in that resiliency that we're talking about. Once you, you have a little good fortune and you have a little money or maybe a piece of goods or something, you see a clan elder or someone who's just an elder and you hand it to him and say, here, there's a gift for you. I'll give you one personal experience, my own. Back in the days when a dollar meant something, it was a real hot day. The temperature was over in the 90s and the 100s. And there were about nine elder men. Some were clan elders, some were not. But they were sitting in the shade in Hardin. They were sitting on the, on the sidewalk, on the ground, in the shade. It was miserable out there. And I had a pocket full of silver dollars. I went down that list, and without regard to who they were, I said, here, get something that'll cool your mouth, something that'll sweeten your mouth, have a cold drink or something, treat yourself. And I gave each one of them a handful of dollars. This was probably July, August. Two months later, I was selected to a job where I was just a, a lowly superintendent out in the Indian country, and all of a sudden they appointed me to a job at the highest level of the American government. 
I was in the office of the Secretary of the Interior, and it was known all over the American country, American world. And then I came home, and uh, my family had a giveaway for me. They said, because he had good fortune, we're going to call you clan elders. And one of them came up and he said, uh, I'm a clan elder, but this young man wanted this kind of good fortune. Then he recalled that he was one of those that was sitting in the shade. And they didn't ask for anything. I just came and gave them some money and said, treat yourself to a cold drink or something. He said, that kind of an act invites good fortune. That's what he did. And he said, when he has competition, he, had, he was resilient enough that he did a good act and he gained much more than he lost by what he gave. I use that as another example because even though you're not being put to the test, do a little something for some elder. They make wishes for you. The, the crows are told that the Creator gave all kinds of gifts to different people. What he gave to the crow was the gift of making wishes and seeing those wishes come true. So we rely on that. That's why we have spirituality all over the place. Everything we do is backed up by spirituality. A prayer, a wish, a clan elder, a name. Uh, the name had good wishes in it. Uh, as a child, you just had a, a, a good wish by somebody and you maintained it as a goal in your life. You do that and you can go out into this country and whether it's Indian or non-Indian, you can succeed. That's the resilience that built in of a culturally rich Indian person. It's your language, it's your name, it's your culture, it's your tribe, and it's how you use all them in your own way. I think I'll end right there, Dr. Rielberg. We will focus on three concepts used for building community in both the Crow culture and the mainstream. The first concept deals with preparing and planning, and the second is based on setting high expectations. The final focus is on support. This is a key element contributing to the success of a Crow College graduate. All of these concepts are universal to our worlds. In setting the stage, we must realize there was once a great civilization, and remnants of their legacy remains. Their practices were based on respect. They were warriors. Their women loyal, dedicated, and institutions of strength. They occupied a vast land base which covered most of Montana, half of Wyoming, the eastern ends of the Dakotas. Prior to that, this great civilization was acknowledged by other nations, including Canada, a possessing territory between Calgary and Lethbridge, Alberta. One could say the territory even extended more into North Dakota because the sister tribe, the Hidatsas, considered them all as one, the Biruga. Within this great civilization were great institutions, some being spiritual and mystical in nature, while others were more practical in living together through respect. This respect was a way of life. It is the primary quality and the foundation of the clan system, Ajamalekha. As this great civilization succumbed to destruction through war, starvation, exile, and genocidal practices of the United States, many of these great institutions became dormant. The spirit of these forces that once flourished have taken refuge in the undisturbed winds, streams, mountains, and stars waiting to be retrieved through visions and divine intervention of those willing to be leaders again. They are said to be waiting for their songs to be sung and their powers to be exercised. The economic system of this great nation was founded on principles of respect. As mentioned previously, the foundations of the clan system, warrior societies, and even through their enemies, as well as the most powerful phenomena, nature. Coinciding with the miracles and resources of nature were the dynamic cycles occurring throughout their lands, such as the migration of certain buffalo and elk herds during a certain month in the spring. Oral 
several accounts describe preparation processes before a certain event like the first thunder in spring or the building of sweat lodges when the cottonwood bud. A reference is made to when the ice breaks or when the plums are green for events such as ceremony, fasting, and offering the pipe. Songs were sung seasonally for the purpose of courtship, romance, and even war and revenge. There were times throughout the seasons to harvest certain medicines and foods when they bud, blossom, bear fruit, and even change color. These natural resources were found throughout their country. They moved entire camps for the purpose of having plenty of wood, a mild winter, and seeking other natural resources that would support their community. In war and politics, they strategized with their allies, even with their enemies, for control of the great natural resources provided by the miracle and power of Mother Earth. They sent emissaries for peace and trade. They sent warriors out to obtain intelligence on the movement of other nations to determine the political and economic impact of their presence in the regions of their country. When it was time to defend or assert their sovereignty, they did not hastily exercise war. It was a well-planned process. It involved preparation. Issues were thoroughly discussed and evaluated. Leaders and former leaders alike were consulted until a consensus was established that victory was imminent. In order to be effective, those with powerful medicines were asked to lead. It was a process of preparing and planning. In emphasizing preparation and planning, Crow students must realize that in the days when they were one of the most powerful nations in the Western Hemisphere, it was exercised with great preparation and planning. Practices were done and should be done with great forethought and consideration. Even today, the great state champions within our reservation did not achieve the greatness out of the clear blue. They exercised and were guided by thorough dedication of being the best. Getting to the point, the responsibility of a Crow student with the intent to succeed in higher education must be done with careful planning, preparation, just like the warriors of this great civilization. It should involve many aspects including support and high expectations, this being the second concept contributing to the success of a Crow educator or warrior. A few years ago, Little Bighorn College had the opportunity to study the effective practices for successful students in higher education. And one of those qualities were the ability of personal mentors and educators to set high expectations for their students. In reflecting upon higher expectations and making connections with the Crow ways of thinking, this coincides with the Absalo Gap practices of making wishes, interpreting dreams and visions acquired through fasting and divine intervention. When a family of a person feeds their clan parents, the reciprocal is a prayer, or as we might say, expectation. The clan father will make wishes for their children, to be leaders, to be educators, to have homes, to be fortunate, to be successful, to be healthy, to be happy, to be great people. With their words and imagery, they set goals for each other. This is why the crow revere and respect the word of mouth. Equal respect is given to the power of dreams and visions because they are considered sources of power and links to the future, a future where it is important to be successful, healthy, prosperous, and happy. Visions achieved through fasting are sources of power. This is a technological and scientific practice of the Absaloge. They were given or achieved great powers to facilitate healing, leadership, knowledge, history, commerce, and even sorcery. Crow students must realize that high expectations set by those who care for them are uttered with the same power and love for them to succeed through the formal institutions practiced by the making of wishes during a clan feed or through dreams or through the power to change the universe through vision. They are all common phenomena in the world, equal concepts for success in both the mainstream and the world of the Apsaloge. Finally, another quality identified in the previous study examining the keys to educational success was having support. 
Most Crow students either had a mentor, such as an older brother, older sister that influenced their goals and success. Others in this role included either parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and spouses. The important issue is having moral support and encouragement on the journey or the mission through education. Think of your goal or task as the warriors of the past. The purpose was for their people whom they love, a way of life that they respect, and the gift of breath in a beautiful world that they occupy. Support is very much like the water for growth. When the music is lively around this support, it makes it more powerful, just like the good rain that helps the sage grow, the noise of the birds and insects even make it better. Crow learners are the same way. The universal concepts that will reinforce resiliency in the mainstream and the crow world are preparing and planning, having high expectations and having active support from mentors or family members. These factors are the key elements that describe a successful Crow educator. In our earlier discussion, we presented situations and conflicts that occur within reservation communities, particularly when someone returns after spending time away and is really passionate about making changes. It is particularly true for Crow people that have recently graduated. They're all fired up and inspired to bring new ideas and changes. They're on a fast track. Then all of a sudden they hit the wall and are totally frustrated because people in their community are not on the same page as them. When a Crow graduate returns, they have options to some how be accepted into the corporate or institutional world of where they are hired. Or another strategy or another environment is to create their own business and develop their own authority. They also can accept the resistance to change and build a long-term plan to slowly chip away at this old guard or another option is just basically to leave. If they leave, the situation is allowing for a great loss of natural and human resource. Staying is a better choice. In the following presentation, information and recommendations will be presented to returning graduates as a means of survival or resiliency. Much of this is based on the cooperation, communication, compromise, and respect, which are all community-based foundations. The following items uh, are efforts or considerations, maybe recommendations, for people returning to the reservation after uh, spending a couple years away. Uh, first recommendation in possibly uh, being on the job for the first day is to show respect. Second recommendation, and prob probably the most powerful one, is to create your own business so that you can do whatever you want. Third thing, Know your job description. A fourth recommendation, start building alliances within the institution so that you can have support, that you can have a community, that you can have uh, people around you that will have the same ideas, uh, have, uh, ex share experiences, share memories, and have some ownership in an institution. Another recommendation is that if you share your ideas, share them with others, not just your boss. Sometimes these bosses, like I said earlier or presented earlier, they uh, sometimes solicit ideas from their staff and take ownership in them and fail to give credit. So uh, for you to receive credit, you will share this, forward this information to an assistant or an associate so that uh, it is acknowledged that the source of these ideas came from your own idea, from your own planning. If you got a plan, present it in detail. It is one of the most effective ways of communicating, cover all bases. And remember that questions are not personal attacks. They are just ways to open communication. They are ways for people uh, to uh, inquire within you of joining your efforts. 
So do not take questions as a threat. Another, uh, another practice for people upon returning to the reservation and gaining employment or working with people is to treat people the way they want to be treated. Another recommendation that a lot of managers and leaders within the community like to exercise is the uh, practice of agreeing to disagree. Sometimes this practice alleviates a lot of controversy and argument and uh, it also allows us to look at different perspectives. Practice your culture. It is your strength. It is the way you determine who you are. And uh, it is also a solid foundation to give you confidence. Continue to learn, seek information, and prepare to be a leader. And remember, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Uh, and don't forget when you do make a mistake, act on it quickly of owning up to it. You admit to people that you did make a mistake and be in uh, the practice of taking responsibility. Set a good example, dress nice, smile, walk with dignity in class. You are an Absaloga person. Be around positive and inspiring people. And finally, listen and learn. Well, that concludes this um, presentation. We covered three topics. We uh, discussed who we are, what we want to do, and how we're going to do that. Number one, we talked about resiliency strategies when we leave our community and go off reservation. We tied universal concepts of resiliency, basically uh, crow thought, and mainstream thought and put them together and looked at them as one practice. Thirdly, we discuss the challenge of uh, some of our graduates returning home and working with their own people, building better means of communication, being thorough, being respectful, making compromises, making consolations and sacrifices for the betterment of community, and just understanding that also they are just one part of this community. The other dynamics are there. I want to thank the Title III program for giving um, myself as well as my associate, Roy Stewart, the opportunity to uh, present some of our uh, research and our practices that we exercise here at Little Bighorn College. And I hope this information contributes to the success of not only our Crow students, but the generation of students to come in our community. Uh -oh.